Hello, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to this beautiful chapel, which opened not too long ago. They did a fantastic job. It's really great to be here. I'm Martin Miller, CEO and General Manager of New England Public Radio. And uh, since I see a lot of students here this evening, which is great. I want you to know a little bit about New England Public Radio, because I hope you'll listen. I'm sure you will online at NEPR.net. But we have uh, three program services. One is Classical HD, which streams online. We have an all news service uh, that you can hear in Hampshire County, primarily on 89.3 FM WAMH, in partnership with Amherst College. And our main signal, 88.5 FM, which is news, classical, and jazz. We also have many podcasts. So I hope you'll check us out at NEPR.net. Uh, one of the podcasts is uh, our Media Lab, which is our youth training program for Springfield and Holyoke High School students, which we're very proud of. So I hope you'll check some of those things out. Uh, this station, WFCR, was started by the five colleges, and we're very grateful to them. And to those of you who have supported New England Public Radio in our community for over 55 years. Thank you all for being here tonight to share your thoughts and to engage with your neighbors. We really do need this kind of conversation now more than ever. We are excited to be here with the Ground Truth Project and WGBH Boston to have a dialogue with you and to help launch their reporting road trip, Crossing the Divide, which begins here in Western Massachusetts. Tonight, you'll be hearing our panelists' stories about their personal experiences of living here in our community of Western Massachusetts. Angelica and Steve have shared their stories on New England Public Radio as part of our commentary series, and we look forward to meeting Ken C. James and Eve tonight. Crossing the Divide is a cross-country reporting road trip produced by WGBH and the Ground Truth Project. Five young reporters will be driving together across the country to explore issues that divide us and stories that unite us. The first of five main stops of the trip is Massachusetts, and Eric Bosco, one of the five fellows, is from Massachusetts and an alum of UMass Amherst. Uh, this morning, the fellows had an opportunity to come to our main headquarters in Springfield for a tour, and they spent some time with our news director, Sam Hudzik. You'll meet them later this evening. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening's discussion, Charlie Sennett. Charlie is founder and executive director of the Ground Truth Project based at WGBH. He was a longtime foreign correspondent for the Boston Globe, and his first job in journalism was actually at New England Public Radio when it was just WFCR. He's also an alum of UMass Amherst. Please welcome Charlie Sennett. Thank you. Thanks, Martin, a lot. I appreciate that. This is definitely a full circle moment. Uh, as Martin shared, I went to school here at UMass Amherst um, and had my first job here. And that was in 1980 when I entered college here. And in 1980, fall of 1980, uh, there was a deeply divided country then, too. There was a time, a transition to President Reagan, sort of dusk, I would call it, on the 60s and 70s. And I felt very much as a, the youngest of a, of a big family, I lived the 60s and 70s. And when I got here, I could feel this transition. I could feel a change. I could feel things shifting. So it's really an honor to be here, to come back all these years later, uh, to be here in my alma mater, and to be standing up this project, Crossing the Divide. Um, it's also a real honor to say that my son is here as well. Will Sennett is right here. He's a student here at UMass. And we're continuing on the generations. So it's, it's really, uh, Really great to be here. Thanks for coming out in the rain. Thank you for being here. I have a lot of thank yous to say, so I'm just going to quickly try to just click a few off. I first, Martin, I just want to say thank you to New England Public Radio for really playing such an important role in this evening. I want to thank um, WGBY Television, which is here and, and are going to be recording this. Um, I also want to thank WGBH News. My, my colleague, Hillary Wells, is the head of WGBH Youth Media 
and really the producer of this project, she's done an unbelievable job in helping us pull it all together, so thanks. Um, you're gonna see also Northampton Community Television is here, we're honored to have them. There's a lot of cameras in the room, and one set of those cameras is also a documentary unit that's recording the journey of these reporting fellows uh, all across the country. I certainly don't want to uh, forget to thank UMass Journalism. Um, the journalism program here is extraordinary. They've been great hosts to us. Uh, we're really honored to be here. And Professor Nick McBride, who I know from, we went to graduate school together. I've known Nick a long time. He's an extraordinary journalist and professor. And he had a lot to do with how we, how we arrived here and how we might think about shaping our reporting here as we begin a journey across the country to think about America at a deeply divided time. It was Nick who really helped us think through how we might, we might look at a division within, um, within the tiers of education and think about education inequality in America. Start our whole journey through the country, looking at divides all across the country and also places where we might come together. And we thought education was a great place to start. And, and Nick, I just want to thank you and your son, Carlos, for really helping us think that through in our reporting in Springfield at Commerce High, where, where Nick went um, and uh, where we're now studying that school, looking at its strengths, looking at its weaknesses, and trying to really understand education in America. Horace Mann said it's the great equalizer. One of the big questions we're going to go to on the panel tonight is, is it still the great equalizer? Is education still the thing that creates equal opportunity in our country? Or as educational divides open up along the lines of income inequality divides, are we seeing our country pull apart right at the very earliest years of public education? Um, there's, there's a lot to talk about. I want to start off just by saying the full circle moment here is, is, is added to uh, and a great honor to say I'm here now uh, in the place where I started my career to be coming 30 plus years later and saying I get to be here with a whole new generation of journalists. So I want to introduce to you the reporting fellows of the Great Divide, uh, the Crossing the Divide project. This is the Crossing the Divide fellows. There are five of them. If you guys would stand up. Uh, <laughs> So I, I, I would love it if you guys would just introduce yourselves. This, is, this was a very competitive process. These are rock stars. These are a great new generation of journalists. And uh, Brittany, if you'd start us off. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Brittany Greeson. Uh, I'm from, I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. I don't really usually deal with these. Um, my name is Brittany Greeson. Uh, I grew up uh, in Western Kentucky, but now I live in report in Detroit. Um, so, yeah, I went to Western Kentucky University, and I'm the photojournalist on this team. Hi, I'm Rachel Kramer. I grew up in Iowa, but I've been living in Montana for the last couple of years and went to the university there in Missoula, Montana. And, um, yeah, today's been kind of a busy day. We got a great tour at the public radio station. We uh, went to Commerce High School and got to talk to some students there which was really good. Uh, we met with them last week, and so it was great to follow up, and they're going to be part of our storytelling for the pieces that are coming out of Massachusetts. And then we went to the Republican, the Republican newspaper and met with the, the editor there. So it's been a busy day, but we're very excited to be here with you all and to hear from the panelists. Good evening, my name is Gabriel Sanchez. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, originally from Caracas, Venezuela, fun fact. Uh, and what I'm most excited about this project in particular is that I've done reporting in several places in the U.S., but obviously never something in this scope. And I think, like with any job, it's very easy to kind of get into a particular autopilot mode or, I don't know, not amplify your, your perspective as much as you'd like. So seeing so many different issues in so many different areas of the U.S., I think will be instructive for me, and I'm sure for us all. So I'm excited to do that. Hi, everyone. I'm Malia Posey. I'm from North Las Vegas, Nevada. I got my bachelor's degree at Howard University in DC, and then I got my master's at UC Berkeley. And I'll be doing the video for this project. 
Uh, hey everyone, I'm Eric Bosco. Uh, I went to this lovely university here. Um, and my first real foray to journalism um, was right here. Uh, it was a story about a student who died of a tragic drug overdose, uh, who was also involved in the confidential informant program uh, here on campus. Some of you may know that story. Um, and I was really lucky um, to have some great mentors and professors behind me on that, on that project. Um, but one thing that sticks out to me about this project is that we're going to be on the ground in communities. And I was able to tell that story and um, uh, some other reporters weren't and it, and it sort of fell through the cracks a lot. Um, but I was able to tell it because I was on the ground. Uh, so to do uh, some reporting and be part of a project like this where being on the ground is so important uh, is just a great opportunity. I'm excited to get started and get back to it. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Um, you guys are fantastic. So, so this journey across the country, you might ask why aren't the fellows up here talking with you? The idea is that they want to be here listening to you um, and to hear from some of our panel, to hear from uh, our, our speaker who I'm going to introduce in a moment is going to help us really frame the dialogue. Um, and the idea is that they're here to really actively listen and we have what we're calling listening events all across the country and they'll be doing this um, from here, they go to Kentucky. From Kentucky, they'll travel up the Mississippi River to Minnesota, Minnesota to Montana, Montana to California. And we'll be looking at a different divide in each of these countries. Along the way, building this project, I've had a chance to meet a lot of extraordinary people who've supported the project. And one of them is here tonight. And I, I just want to say thank you to Al Combs, who's here, who's from Kentucky, from born in Pikeville, where we'll be centering our work. And he happens to be my neighbor in Harvard, Massachusetts. And we met over coffee at the general store, and we became friends. And he has been a great supporter of this project. Thanks, Al. Really appreciate that. All right, so, so how, do you, how do you possibly get at this? How do we start to really think about this incredibly divided moment we're in as a country? Um, this moment really, I would argue, needs good journalism. We have to get back to work. We have to do the work that really matters. We have to be there on the ground. We have to be sure that, that when we're in a community, that that community is being heard and that we're telling their story. And when I thought about how I want to frame this, uh, it really coincided with uh, uh, an event in, in Oxford, of all places, where I happened to run into a former colleague, Ray Suarez. And when I saw Ray and I heard he was going to be a visiting professor at Amherst College at the same time we'd be starting this, I said, Ray, I really hope you can come and speak with these reporters. What I didn't know is Ray would also volunteer to speak to you and to share uh, a conversation um, on how we frame this divide. I want to introduce Ray. For, for people my age, Ray really doesn't need much introduction. Um, but Ray Suarez is... Uh, a journalist of more than 40 years. He's one of the colleagues for whom I have the greatest respect. Uh, Ray had a long career uh, that begins, uh, I guess, like all journalists, he probably began telling stories where he's from, which is Brooklyn. But he traveled around the country, went to NYU, went to University of Chicago, worked in Chicago, worked in Los Angeles, worked for ABC News in New York, worked for CBS, uh, CBS Radio, worked in London for the Associated Press. But where he really came on the radar, for me at least, and probably for many of you, was as the host of Talk of the Nation, national public radio show, Talk of the Nation, which always framed uh, issues. And I always relied on, on Ray to do that uh, for us. He also was the host and anchor of uh, PBS NewsHour for a long time. And there again, was really part of framing stories in our country and more recently went to Al Jazeera America, which did amazing work for a little while. And now it is no longer with us. Uh, Al Jazeera America has moved on. Um, this community has the unbelievable opportunity to have Ray in its midst while he's in transition. And so I'm really honored to ask Ray to come and join me on the stage for a conversation. <laughs> So I want 
want to just right away, um, first of all, just say thanks for being here. No, it's nice, nice to be here. It's asked. great to have you here. Can everybody hear okay? Mics are working. We're good. Okay. Ray, how do we define this moment? It feels um, like we're in a time of deep division, but are we? Is this as divided as it feels? How would you put it in historical perspective from your, your many years as a journalist? I think it, it has the potential to uh, be the peer in terms of crisis of uh, eras like um, the late 19th century, uh, the 30s, and the 1960s. And yet, at the same time, on paper, we're richer, we live longer, we're better educated, more people have more things than their own grandparents even ever could have imagined. And yet, there's this tremendous unease and unquestionable divisions in the country. This would be uh, the most important moment for the news business to help Americans understand the world that meets them at their front door, except that the news business is in crisis and has lost the confidence of the public that really needs a healthy news business to form a coherent vision of the world. Um, you know, it's been a long time since we've lived the kind of life where you only needed to know what you could see and touch a totally, totally empirical life. If you think about it, a lot of the things that are important for you to know, you know because somebody told you. Somebody secondhand, thirdhand, fourthhand. Um, you don't know that the Rohingyas are being slaughtered because you've been to Burma. You know that they're being slaughtered because a journalist has been to Burma and has helped put that issue into context for you. Now maybe that doesn't change your life very much, but one of the ways you're going to know about Hurricane Irma, which is uh, headed right for Puerto Rico now and will make landfall in the next couple of hours, the most powerful hurricane ever measured in the Atlantic Ocean. One of the reasons you're going to know about that is not because you're going to Puerto Rico anytime soon, uh, but because the news business is going to rise to the challenge and help you understand what that's all about. Gallup has been asking people about their faith in American institutions since every year since the end of the Second World War. And all of the big centers of authority in society have lost the confidence of people. The church, the academy, elected officials, and the news business as well. But the news business has really plummeted in public esteem and public credibility. At the same time as that was happening, the business model on which the business relies to be healthy and be able to pay reporters and uh, sustain crews in the field and all the things that a news organization has to do, the business model is in tatters. Uh, in part destroyed by the advent of the internet. Uh, Craig Newmark is a, is a lovely guy and a visionary guy, but Craigslist has helped usher newspapers in America to their graves uh, through the loss of advertising uh, and classifieds. It was an unintended consequence, but there it is. Uh, those ads for apartment rentals uh, were helping to pay the salaries of reporters, and now they're all gone. And a lot of these things are the result of unintended consequences of technological change. Just as the tools and the toys that we use to tell stories get cheaper and better and easier to use, thus democratizing them, small d, making them uh, accessible to more people and usable by more people, uh, the audience shrinks at the same time, which creates a social threat. The 1950s were not such a great time. I, people love to rhapsodize about the 1950s and get nostalgic about the 1950s. They weren't so great if you were certain kinds of Americans. But one thing that was true was that most Americans got their news from the three networks, got a daily newspaper, most American adults, 
And it was a society that largely knew the same things. Many of the things they knew were false. But it was a society where there was a shared cultural experience of living in the United States. We knew a lot of the same things. Because of the trail of the last 60 years, we've broken up a mass audience into tiny mosaic tiles and made discrete audiences in a way that in, many people in this room can know totally different things about the same topic, the same idea, the same proposition. You can come away believing totally different things about these parts of our shared life. It's not that it's dangerous, but it's tricky because coming up with any kind of common wisdom, coming up with any kind of answers to these challenges becomes immediately more difficult when we no longer know the same things and no longer believe the same people and no longer believe what we're being told by the people whose job it is to tell us stuff. You should see the trend line since 1945 in, in the lack of faith in the news business. The only thing worse is Congress. But who covers Congress? A news business that nobody believes. So, you know, it's a, it's a difficult moment for the society, but only made more challenging by the unintended consequences of technological change and the idea that we can all create our own information ecosystems that leave us unable to stand on the same ground. We may come to different conclusions, but we can't even begin the great debates of today standing on the same ground. We, had a, we have a president now who told us that people were pouring over the southern border of the United States. Those were the words he used. Every campaign appearance, pouring over the southern border. People weren't pouring over the southern border. We've been at net negative with Mexico for years. Maybe Donald Trump knows, maybe he doesn't know that most of the people who are currently living illegally in the country and working illegally in the country didn't cross that southern border on foot. Maybe undermining the need for building a $30 billion wall. Most people came legally and got out of status as they stayed. They came with visas. So building a wall is not going to stop people with visas. Uh, if we have to come up with some ideas about how to kickstart a new American revival, we can't do it if we, ca we can't even agree on what to disagree on. And I, it's a very troubling moment, unlike the 1960s, where people knew what the problems were. They just disagreed about the solutions. And they shared a set of facts. And they shared a set of facts. Which is one of the hard things now is that it's almost as if there are different sets of facts. Well, the last time we had this kind of social division, we didn't have a parallel information business risen up to become the mirror image of the news business that weaponizes doubt, that as effectively injects falsehoods and lies into the public bloodstream as effectively as the news business is trying to get good information, arguably, into the public bloodstream. All right, before we completely uninspire a whole new generation of journalists, I want to, I want to pivot for a second and say I agree with everything you're saying. I think you framed the moment we're in beautifully. I want to transition a little bit to talk about the role that journalists can play in getting us out of this. We know the role that, that the digital age is playing in terms of filter bubbles and echo chambers and the ways in which it's pulling us apart. I am old school enough to believe that journalism really can play a role, that the public service calling of journalism needs to play a role to get us back on track as a country that can at least talk to each other, can at least have a dialogue. You mentioned we don't know what's happening in Burma unless we 
hear from a reporter in Burma, and it, it got me thinking with my colleagues who are here, uh, Kevin Grant, our executive editor, we took a journey to Burma. We reported with 20 young journalists, uh, 10 American, 10 Burmese. And we had to train them because they're covering a set of civil wars within Burma. And we had to give them very intense physical safety training. We had to do the same thing when we cut, took a team to the Arab Spring in Egypt or when Ben Brody, uh, who's one of the team leaders on this project, was reporting in Afghanistan. He had a military background, but even as a journalist, you still have to get your training up and you have to think about safety in the field. And this team, recently, we were putting them through the paces of physical training. Now, they're gonna be traveling in America, not Burma, not Egypt. But I really think journalists face an incredible peril right now in the United States uh, as they set out to do a reporting journey. The President of the United States has really called out journalists, said that they are the enemy of the people. Um, and I want to really challenge that, uh, not in a partisan way, but in a, in a really heartfelt way of craft. I totally reject that. I think journalists are, are much needed right now. And, and as a journalist who's done a lot of foreign reporting, I'm pretty horrified that we have to train a new generation to prepare for things like Charlottesville to prepare for violence in our own streets, to prepare for a turning against the truth tellers. And they're gonna have to really fight like hell to get out there and tell these stories. I, and I wanted to just ask you, what does it mean when journalism goes uh, from being, you know, sort of uh, caught in the crossfire to actually being in the crosshairs, to being targeted, to being pointed out as part of the problem? How do we do our job when we're seen as, as taking one side or part of a problem? How do we navigate that? How do we get back to doing the good work? Journalists are being killed at a rate that um, is unlike anything we've seen before. And in whose interest is it to kill a journalist? Think about that for a minute. Who, in what circumstance, in which countries would someone of power, influence, and authority want to kill a journalist? It's a way of chasing the truth back into the closet. And it's a way of being able to control the working reality of a population. If this story is not told, if I can scare these people off from telling this story, I can control what is eventually regarded as the truth. It is horrifying to consider that a place that we had thought was apart from um, the cartel wars in Mexico, um, the civil wars in Latin America, uh, the terrible bloodletting in the Great Lakes region in East Africa, the United States, a place that we didn't think of as being vulnerable to that kind of appeal is a place where now some of the most powerful people in the country lead crowds in jeering and deriding reporters. That, it's not because I'm a reporter that I think that's horrifying. Everybody in this room should think that's horrifying. Now what they want to do is to be able to tell their story without anybody else saying, now wait a minute. They want to take the now wait a minute or the yeah but out of the conversation. And that's the beginning of a controlled information world. That's the beginning of a controlled information diet for citizens. And that's the beginning of the end of democracy. And it may sound very dramatic to say that, but it's not, I'm not over-dramatizing a situation where a leader both extols the ability to evade, avoid, and lie to the press, but at the same time tries to turn the public against the press. Mm. That leader is tapping into something that I think you'd agree with me is a failure of journalism too, that somehow we failed to hear this country. We failed to get out into corners of the country that were undercovered, corners of the country that uh, are hurting, where, where industrial jobs are gone, where the forces of globalization are at work. 
And I really think there's something to the anger in America against the media that we need to also really listen Absolutely. to. So Absolutely. Absolutely. How do we take that in? How do we, how do we absorb that, but at the same time sort of have the courage to go out and confidently do our craft and go out and tell the stories and listen carefully? How do we step it up and get better at this? That same technological revolution that has destroyed our business model and put old, revered news organizations into crisis has also created a world of opportunity, created the ability uh, to tell stories and distribute content uh, seamlessly, with low cost, um, to, uh, to do your jobs in a way that doesn't require tremendous amounts of cash and access, think about access to television. You know, you can't go to your local television station and say, hey, I just shot this great story and I edited it on Final Cut Pro and I cut the track myself and I did all the research, put it on tonight's news. It's a narrow gateway. It's a narrow uh, uh, waistline in the, in the hourglass that, that sorts people out and says, yes, you get to be on television. You get to talk to hundreds of thousands of people, but you don't. The web is destroying that exclusive access to eyeballs, to eardrums, to the working minds mm -hmm. of a potential audience. The models aren't there yet for this, you know, they're, they're in formation. These new channels, these new brands, there's going to have to eventually be a flight to quality as people realize they don't know the real truth about real big challenges in the country. And when that happens, uh, there will be coalescing around new nodes of distribution, um, a new generation of reporters. I mean, basically, you and your peers and the people who are getting into the, to the game now have to save the business. And, and by doing that, you're not just uh, saving a way of life and a way of making a living you're also um, giving a very, very important blood transfusion to democracy. And that's, that's not a small thing. Um, I, was, I was involved in a, a conversation recently at, um, at Aspen Meadows, and I was interrogating panelists, and one of the panelists said, you can't run a state without facts. And I thought, gee, that's about as simple as it gets. What is it, six words, seven words? You can't run a state without facts. Right now, weaponizing doubt, turning facts into opinion, saying to somebody who's got a fact, oh, well, that's, that's just your opinion. Rendering all impressions to be of equal value. What that does is gives power to shape reality to the person who has all the levers at their disposal. Ed education is the great leveler. Information is the great leveler, too, because a population can't be as easily gulled, fooled, misled if they have uh, access to the truth and can talk back to leaders who will tell them things that are, that are not true. That's a great place to transition, I think. Um, I want to just say, Ray, I knew I could count on you to frame a tough moment, and I, um, I love what you had to say. Thank you very much. Thanks for, for having here. me, Charlie. Good Thank to see you. you. So we're going we're gonna, to um, we invite our panelists up uh, to come on up. If you want to lead, Ken, just come around. Um, and take your seats. Um, while I'm waiting for the panel to come up, I want to just say um, uh, that's the easiest interview I've ever done. <laughs> you just had to take it, and it was like this unfurling of a flag of what we believe in and who we are, and a reminder of this crap. You guys, it is on your shoulders.
whether you want to recognize it or not, um, you really have this role to play. Uh, and I, 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 I love the wisdom that it just departed. One of the things um, that we wanted to do in this was to have Ray frame a national um, lay of the land, for the terrain that we're in right now. But we wanted to also pay close attention to the community, to the Pioneer Valley, uh, this place where um, all of you have so many connections and where I have a deep connection. This is a, this is a great place in America. And tonight our goal was to try to celebrate it, but also get a little bit outside of the tofu curtain. I want it to be a real conversation with a lot of points of view. I want to really invite anyone in the audience who wants to share your thoughts from any perspective uh, to, to know you're, you're, you're very welcome here and please bring them forward. So I'm going to start off um, just by uh, introducing our panelists uh, and I'll do it sort of quickly and then I'm going to, I'm going to um, come back to Eve to frame, to frame a global perspective on this. But Eve Weinbaum is an associate professor and former director of UMass Amherst Labor Center. Uh, she's a labor organizer. She's the author of a book called To Move a Mountain, Fighting the Global Economy in Appalachia. So Eve has this extraordinary role here for us in terms of helping us understand some global forces that are at work and that are at play right here in the valley where she lives, where her kids go to school in Amherst High School. Um, and also to take us to the next leg of our journey, which is Appalachia. So not easy to do in two minutes, but if you could just give us a sense of the forces of globalization that are right here in this local community. Okay. Um, I'll try. I mean, I, I guess it's interesting to me that you are here and then going to Appalachia. I had the opposite journey, which is that I worked in Appalachia for um, a number of years before I came up here to New England. Um, and in some ways, uh, listening to your conversation, I was thinking that a lot of my work was about bridging divides. Um, I was a union organizer for a while with clothing and textile workers, and then I worked with an organization called the Highlander Center. Um, and I started that work in the early 90s, um, when the main thing going on in that region was deindustrialization, plant closings, uh, mainly plants that had moved from New England or New York or this area uh, to the south because they were escaping unions or regulation or higher wages. Um, and in the early 90s, they were moving on. They were leaving the south and going further south um, or to other parts of the world. Some of them were just moving down the road a ways where they could get some good tax breaks. Um, and so I was studying that phenomenon. And what I found was um, that the workers uh, were really being pitted against each other, that they, there wasn't just, there were divides within the, uh, within the region, certainly. There have been racial divides there for hundreds of years. Um, there have been economic divides and, and other kinds of divisions. Uh, but what was happening in that period was that workers were being divided. Um, there, were, uh, there were political leaders who were telling the workers, you're losing your jobs because those workers in Mexico want them more. Um, they'll, they'll work harder, they'll work for less. Um, there were uh, corporate leaders who were telling the workers, you're losing your job because you weren't willing to do the work we wanted you to do. Um, there were other business leaders who were telling the workers it's because of those people. You know, there were certain people in this factory who were usually identified by race or ethnicity who uh, were not holding up their side of the bargain. So I saw a real pattern of workers being uh, divided and spent a lot of time thinking about how do we bridge that divide. Um, and so since I've been up here, I've been working a lot with, uh, with labor unions and with st my students who are working with labor unions and thinking about how to bring workers together uh, to fight for what they need. Okay, thanks. I mean, I think we need to think globally about this divided time and how those global forces are pulling us apart. So that's a great framing, and thank you. And I want to um, shift to you, Jim. Um, James Terrapain is director of the Museum of Our Industrial Heritage in Greenfield. He's a retired machinist, and just in talking to Jim on the phone a little bit, 
um, was able to hear his own story in this place. And I remember being a reporter here in the 1980s and covering, it felt like every month I was covering a plant closing. Um, those global forces were really taking off in the 80s and then um, continued into the 90s. But you were there, you were, you were living that, uh, that history, Jim. And you, I want you to just help us frame this region, which had these great industrial jobs and great jobs for machinists. What do we need to know now from this community about how they're feeling? Are they feeling left out in this community? And how does that express itself politically? Yes. Um, well, first of all, for you that don't know it, this region we're in right now is, is the cradle of American industry. Um, and it's very closely tied to American history. It's a very interesting subject. Um, it's brought great wealth and security to our country, and it's, it has a long heritage. And uh, most of us in the, in the business and manufacturing are very, very proud of, of that. Um, I'm sort of the poster child for living through the deindustrialization. Literally, I, when I started, and I'm a journeyman machinist, when I started in the trade, um, was about the peak in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. And my whole career has been um, staying one step ahead of plant closures and trying to recalculate my, my career several, several times. And, um, and it's, it's been relentless. A um, hundred years ago, we were on the better side of this issue. Um, we were we were the supplier of the world with all this great technology, and um, to this day, um, these famous names of these companies around here are known known all over the world. But now now we're on the short end of the stick, and uh, uh, it's it's taking many forms. Um, some of the older industries I worked in, some of the old older industries that just um, just couldn't make it, could do it cheaper overseas. Um, not only, only that, but we, recently I just, um, I was working at a local company for 17 years, a local homegrown company, um, spun right off of UMass here, very successful company, um, ended up being bought by a foreign company, and I basically got downsized out. So that's um, another form of, of globalization. It's taken many forms. Um, so, Jim, how we is do, it, and, and how, how has your experience? Because you've you've got colleagues, you've got guys who you've worked with for mm -hmm. decades and who you know well. Right. As that economy erodes around them, and those jobs disappear over many decades, and now there's a sense of not much is left. A lot of the pensions are gone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it doesn't feel like journalism's done a good job of hearing that. No, but you no. have heard it. What can oh, you yeah. share with us about how how some of your, your 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 fellow workers in this industry who no longer have those great jobs? How do they feel now? What do we need to hear from them? Yeah, well, they they feel that they've made you know they've made contributions to to the economy and and in this country just like a lot of people, and they, they really feel like they're, they're being let down. Um, wages, benefits continue to erode, while more and more responsibility is being shifted to the worker, but not the authority and the resources to do it. It's very, very frustrating. And um, so I think that's probably where um, our president tapped into some of that resentment, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's something that, um, it's an easy, easy, you know, you want to blame somebody. You want, you know, and we have nobody to blame. <laughs> so um, I think the, uh, you know, the, the uh, mantra of bringing back jobs and uh, so forth is, is appealing to people. And, uh, but as we know, it's a lot more complex than, than that. I mean, it's, there's, there's a lot to it. I mean, what we're really, this region we're in is fairly resilient because of its diversity of uh, 
people, educational institutions, and technologies that we've, we've been able to do a little better than um, some, you know, some regions of the country. I think there's plenty of hope here at the same time. Okay, uh, and I want to come back to that. I'd love to talk about some of the transitions mm -hmm. that are going on, but I think you said a very important note, which is that this president has tapped into a sense of betrayal among a lot of people who are willing to blame both parties for this failure, but, but that populism has worked for sure in trying to assign blame. And another part of, of this presidency uh, has been to try to say that blame falls on, on immigrant shoulders, as Eve shared with us. This has been a constant theme, and it's really been a powerful theme in the news in the last few days as we've gone through uh, all of the rescinding of, of the DREAM Act that, the, that uh, President Trump has put forward. Okay, it's a six month delay, he's handing it off to Congress, but it's an issue that's a hot button issue that also divides us. Um, there's a dividing line, it seems, between wanting to blame immigrants and those of us who've forgotten we're all immigrants. Unless you're Native American to this country, we are all immigrants. And I, I wanna just use that to pivot to introduce um, Angelica Marino, who is a graduate of Holyoke Community College, just graduated. Um, is herself an immigrant from El Salvador and is a DACA recipient. So DACA is the program uh, commonly known as the DREAM Act, which tried to really, really give cover to those children of immigrants who came here because their parents brought them here. And that is now being rolled back and rescinded. So you're in a, you're in a tough spot all of a sudden and you're part of this divide. You're literally walking along the line of that divide. And I was wondering if you would just sort of share with us your story. Um, you come here as a very young girl, 11 years old. What's the journey been like and when did it suddenly feel like you went from being an immigrant to this country to being on a side of a divide? How did that open up in front of you? Um, yeah, so I am originally from El Salvador. Um, I came here when I was 11 years old. Um, my mom, um, you know, she brought us here. Uh, I went to middle school and high school here. Um, and it wasn't until high school, you know, when I realized that my immigration status um, really affected me, right? After high school, um, I couldn't apply to UMass. Um, I couldn't, you know, get a driver's license. Um, and I couldn't get a job, right? Something that most of us, you know, do at around, you know, 16 um, or 17. So that was when it really hit me that, you know, um, being undocumented and then after documented um, was very divisive because, you know, most of my fellow, um, you know, students were moving on to uh, four-year institutions, they were moving on to college, they were getting their driver's license, they were getting jobs while, you know, I was really stuck. You know, I couldn't do any of these things um, that they were able to do. Um, but even so, I decided to apply to Holyoke Community College because I think as you know, someone said, education is power. Um, and even with my status, I still wanted to get an education and I really wanted one. So um, I realized then that um, I couldn't be um, an in-state tuition at Holyoke Community College. Um, I had to pay out-of-state tuition which you know a lot of you know that it's a lot more expensive. So you're like 18 at that point. I was 18. So it's sort of like, for seven years you just feel like you're an immigrant to this country, you've got this opportunity, but all of a sudden the wall yes, is it, right in front of you. Yes, it hits. <laughs> so that's when it, you know, it really hit me. Um, so that's when you know, I decided to still keep going. You know, I got a job um, and I was doing school, right? But I couldn't really afford it until I got DACA, um, and DACA has a lot of problems of its own, um, and we can talk about that too, because DACA itself, it creates a divide between you know, the people who have DACA and then the immigrants who do not have DACA. It also creates a divide between our parents, right? Because mm -hmm. DACA says that it's for students who were brought here by their parents, but it wasn't their fault, right? But we don't want to blame our parents for this, right? We don't want to uh, demonize our parents 
for bringing us here. If anything, we're thankful, you know, that they brought us here. Um, and so I think that a lot of the language that is used to describe DACA and to describe, you know, dreamers is it's really a problem, mm -hmm. you know, because it's it also creates that, you know, good immigrant versus bad immigrant, you know, the good ones are the ones who mm -hmm. are going to school, um, you know, the ones who are getting jobs, the ones who have, you know, a 4.0, and then the bad ones, you know, are the ones that are not doing all of this. Mm -hmm. But it's not really because they don't want to, it's because they really can't. That's really interesting and something I hadn't thought of about sort of some of the divides within the immigrant community itself. Uh, good immigrants quotes, bad immigrants. Yes. Um, all right, thank you. I want to come back to talk about sort of your dreams, like even though the DREAM Act is a little bit in question, you have amazing dreams, and we're going to, I want to come back to those. But I want to, I want to say, this is sort of like, I, we didn't set this up, it's alphabetical, but the transition's like perfect. So sometimes these things work. I think we've heard, we've heard about uh, the global economy, we've heard about the regional economy, and we've heard about the forces that divide us in immigrant communities and around the issue of immigration. But the one thing I think all of us feel you have that can pull us together is education, right? I mean, we all have, uh, benefited from education. For those of us who have families, who have kids, education is, is the great equalizer. It's the chance for us to hand to our children equal opportunity and education. It's a powerful theme that I hope would pull us together. And I transition really elegantly here to Steve Schultes, who is a Springfield parent, who is a teacher himself, um, who is uh, part of uh, um, a community in Springfield that is proud of and fighting like hell for its schools. And we've been in those schools and we've seen the amazing talent of young people there um, and had a chance to really um, spend some time with them and hear from them. Um, but in your blog, Rational Urbanism, and on, on the powerful essay you did on New England Public Radio, you've really articulated something about education as an equalizer. Where would you want to take us to navigate, how do we understand this incredibly divided moment we're in as a country? What role will education play in helping us get out of that divide? I, I think that'd be too big a question for me. I want to start where Ray began, which was with journalism, because my journey started uh, at the top of the journalism business as a paper boy for the morning union, which is what the Republican used to be called, uh, and I would go around and deliver the paper every day. And it was a period of time in the mid-70s when Springfield was really in decline, when we really realized things were going bad. A uh, department store named Forbes and Wallace had closed, and there was real panic about what was happening, especially in the downtown. And so a lot of the business community got together, and together with what is now the Republican, they put together a plan for downtown Springfield. And as I was delivering the paper uh, Monday through Saturday, I saw, and this was you know, the first time they were putting full color on the front of the newspaper, and I was seeing these um, artist drawings of what the new downtown Springfield would look like. And I just had always loved going downtown and being downtown. My mom was a uh, stay-at-home mom, and when I hit middle school, junior high, we called it then, uh, she got a job at a place called the Leprechaun Shop in Bay State West. And so she would encourage me to hop on the bus and go down there and meet her and then come back after work with her. But of course, when I got there, she was already at work. I would wander around the streets of downtown. And to me, and I realized that those of you who are from Brooklyn, Springfield's not a city. It's a city to me, and I loved it. I loved everything about it. I loved the side streets. I loved the vacant windows uh, or the vacant storefronts. I loved the ones that were full. I just loved the architecture. I loved everything about it. Um, and fast forward a few years. Don't worry. I'll move along. Um, fast forward a few years, and I, I, I went to college. Okay. I went to college in the Mountain West uh, and then in Europe, in Spain. And I fell in love with cities, especially not in the Mountain West, in Europe. And when I came back, I said, you know what? Kids love cities. I think cities are a whole lot better for kids than suburbs. So when I come back and get married as a, you know, like normal middle class, as it turns out, high school teacher, 
I'm going to live in downtown Springfield because that's what I want to do. And people looked at me and my now ex-wife as if we were insane. You don't, between, between 1982 when I graduated and, and 1990 when I started to teach, um, that idea was ridiculous. If you were a white middle class guy, you lived in Longmeadow or Wilbraham and you sent your kids to school there and that's all you did. It was, it was ridiculous not to do that. But my wife and I, if you ever see the movie, The uh, Princess Bride, it works. Um, the, when Wesley is becoming the Dread Pirate Roberts and he gets told, good work today, Wesley, probably kill you in the morning. And you know, but he doesn't and he becomes the Dread Pirate Roberts. That's what happened with, with my wife and I and our daughters. We'd say, you know what, let's try kindergarten here. And we said, yeah, that was great. You know, let's do first grade. Let's do second, third, fourth at Milton Bradley. We live in one of the poorest neighborhoods in the city. Milton Bradley has uh, one of the poorest populations of kids in the city, but the teachers were great. Everything about it was fantastic. The, the principal was unbelievable. And then uh, there was a school choice system back then at the junior high school level, middle school, they called it then. And my daughters chose to go to Forest Park Middle School, where I went to junior high. And they had the best experience ever. They had the best teachers. They could imagine there was one teacher in particular that my older daughter had first period. She would never miss school. She only missed one day of school after first grade. She never missed school in junior high because she wanted to be in Mr. Levesque's science class every day. And then my younger daughter had Mr. Levesque, but not first period. Then they got to choose a high school and they both chose, my older daughter chose Commerce High School for the IB program. The, the school that you visited today. Um, she graduated in uh, 2008 as salutatorian with a full IB certificate and got a full scholarship, the most generous scholarship awarded by a school that I think some of you in here may have heard of, Smith College. It's called the Springfield Scholar Program. Now, I don't think that program was designed for daughters of high school Spanish teachers, but my daughter worked hard, qualified, did that, my younger daughter, because she wanted to be with her older sister, uh, went to Commerce as well. She was a little bit different. She didn't do the full IB program. She was the kind who made her own way. She ended up going to Salem State on the Abigail Adams Scholarship, uh, which means she got excellent scores on the MCAS tests. She actually outperformed my older daughter on the standardized tests. She you just wasn't got, as motivated. You know I gotta come in now and ask yeah. you, what is this, what does your journey, your family, your story, tell us about the role education can play. Well, you want to talk about a divided America. Yeah. I think a lot of people here live in a lot of isolated places with a lot of people that look like themselves because they're afraid to send their kids to Springfield Public Schools or the Holyoke Public Schools. Well, don't do that. Move in. Send your kids to those schools. When, when your children get married and have kids, or don't get married and have kids, and they have kids, okay? And they, they're looking for a place to live, and they find a nice Victorian in McKnight in Springfield, don't say, oh, no. You're gonna have little Billy going to those schools. Schools are great, by the way. Schools are fantastic. I just to say one thing. If you look at the physical plant of the schools that I went to as a Springfield resident, all but one of the schools I went to, K through 12, we're built in the 19, we're built in the, uh, the, the 19th century. Classical, Forest Park, Washington Street, okay? All the schools my daughters went to, living in one of the poorest neighborhoods in the city, all brand new. Commerce, the building's gorgeous. It was redone, what, 12 years ago, 13 years ago? Forest Park, same thing. Milton Bradley, brand new. They took an old insurance company. The physical plant, the investment, the teachers are so much more professional now than they were when I went there. I remember being at Forest Park, turn up the heat, put on a movie, watch the kids fall asleep. But the schools had a great reputation. No, it's true, the schools had a great reputation. Why? Because the kids looked like your kids. So they're good. And now what happens, last thing, now what happens is people will do something ridiculous like compare the test scores or the dropout rates from Commerce High School to Longmeadow High School, and they'll say, well, Longmeadow High School has higher scores, fewer dropouts, so it's a better school. It's ridiculous. 
Like I was saying to you, it's like if I run an emergency room and you're a podiatrist, and then you, know, you look at the fatality statistics, and you say, well, more people die at that emergency room, so obviously he's a crappy doctor. That's ridiculous. The kids that go to the Springfield Public Schools are coming from more difficult circumstances. They're more difficult to educate. But we all know if you just took all the kids from Commerce and plopped them into Longmeadow High School, and all the kids from Longmeadow and plopped them into Commerce High School, the scores would go with the kids, not with the teachers and the building. And so we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't be comparing Commerce to Longmeadow. We should look at Commerce and say, what can we do to make it better? Because I'm not saying it's perfect, by the way. I know there are problems at Commerce. My daughters went there, okay, four years each. I was actively involved. I know what's going on, but don't giving us these reflections on a divided American saying, well, look at, look at Minichog and look at this. Forget Minichog. Forget Minichog. Let's fix commerce. And also, if you want to fix it up here above the tofu curtain, move to Springfield. Send your kids to Springfield Public Schools. Otherwise, honestly, I don't want to hear what you have to say. I don't. No, but I don't. You'd just be up there and you want to comment on what we ought to do to fix the problem, when what we really need to fix the problem is you. We need you to come, and America won't be divided if we're uh, not afraid of each other. If, if we move in to neighborhoods with people that don't look like us, and we're sending our kids to school with other kids that don't necessarily look like us, all of a sudden we're not divided. Who's dividing us? Okay, so... That's my pitch on behalf of Springfield. Please move in. All right. It's a beautiful pitch. Um, and I want to go to another proud Springfield resident. Um, and uh, Ken Gillette is uh, someone who we've gotten to know uh, just recently, but really um, has a pretty amazing story of his own as a Haitian immigrant, um, is a uh, member of the uh, uh, parent-teacher organization inside of Springfield and is a candidate for Springfield City Council as a Republican. And I want to just have you talk a little bit about the immigrant journey that you've experienced and how, how you got where you are uh, in Springfield, both, both professionally, personally, politically, but also my favorite part of your bio is that you're a psychotherapist. I think this country really needs some psychotherapy. <laughs> we need some time on the couch, Ken. So can you? We'll make a line at the end. <laughs> can you help us? Um, just would love to hear your story and, and help us navigate how, how do we get through this very divided time in our country? And what role do you think you can play as, as a parent, as, as someone um, who is very active in your community? Thank you, thank you. Um, so just to clarify, first of all, my parents immigrated to the US and then they had all of us. I'm in the middle of seven children. So growing up, it was a chaos at home nonstop. Um, I appreciate it now that I'm out, but when I was in there, I, I wanted to leave. So you're second generation? Second, second generation. Okay. Wait, no, first generation born in the US. Right. So I'm from New York State originally. I grew up in a small town in Inuit. Um, it wasn't that, that diverse of a community, actually. It was, it was more a middle class, upper middle class, more Caucasian. Um, after high school, I knew I wanted to go as far away as possible. Again, six siblings, I'm the middle child. I wanted to leave. So I went away to the college at Pace University and got my degree in psychology. And then I went to grad school also at Pace, got my degree in a, a master's degree in mental health counseling. Now, while I was finishing up my undergraduate degree, it was around 2008, 2009 when the Obama, Obama was running for office. And up to that point, I had no interest whatsoever in any kind of politics. I had no idea what was going on. Um, but once I saw that there was a, a black man running for president, I figured, you know what, maybe I should start looking at things and figuring how I can get involved as well. So I got involved pretty heavily on campus, and I was all for you know, his message. It made a lot of sense to me, and I voted for him. Once I got in, I was so happy. Me and my friends were so happy. We figured, you know what, it's our duty now to stay engaged, be, be, be involved with the, the hope and change that, that, that we're expecting. And then six months later, I realized that a lot of my views didn't exactly line up with the views of the president then, Obama. Um, so I realized that to my horror that, oh my God, I think I'm a Republican. <laughs> uh, and, and my family, they're all Democrats, you know, from, from the get-go. My parents were, became citizens along the process, along the way. Um, but I hid the fact that I had some Republican views for like a year for my friends, my close friends. I hid it for like a year. Um, but then after I graduated my undergrad, I went to grad school, I met a lot of other people 
that also had other views and they happened to be more leaning to the right. Um, so I finished grad school and I applied to jobs all around the country. I knew I just wanted to work right away. And the, the, one of the first calls I got was in Springfield. And I, so I drove up there a couple hours and I interviewed with my boss uh, at Alan Stone at the Center for Psychological and Family Services in Springfield. And it was a three hour interview. You know, I think we spent five minutes on my resume in the remaining three hours talking about everything under the face of the sun, everything. Um, and I knew that I wanted to move here. He talked so, spoke so highly of Springfield and all the great things they had here, I knew that I wanted to move here. So I literally, in, in less than a month, me, my wife, and then my two kids, we moved over to Springfield from New York. Um, and in that time, I started working as a therapist. I learned so much about Western Mass and Springfield for my patients. More than any realtor could have told me. I knew where to go, where to avoid, what was, where was good to eat. In fact, I had one of my clients tell me, you know, if, if you and your wife want to go out tonight and be safe, go to this place. It's controlled by the mob. They're fine, you know. <laughs> so I learned everything about Springfield from my clients. And once we decided after a couple of years that we wanted to buy a house in, in Springfield, we only looked here. And all my friends back home, friends that I had, I made here in Western Mass, they're telling me, go to Aguam, go to West Springfield, go to Chicopee. Why would you want to buy a house in Springfield? But I said, what are you talking about? I've been here for two years. I've been around the city, and I love it. So we bought a house here. We bought a house a couple years ago, and we just finished unpacking, I think, like, like last week. It was a lot. <laughs> but, and as soon as we bought a house, I wanted to get involved. I wanted to put roots down, deep roots down. Because growing up, in my small town, it was the kind of town where no one locked the front doors. You know, I remember growing up, my parents would leave their, their keys on the dashboard of the cars all summer. You couldn't think of doing that today, you know? You can't even leave your doors unlocked and sometimes. So I wanted that community, so I wanted to get involved right away. So I got involved in the PTO of a Pottinger Elementary School where my kids go, and I became president for the past couple of years. And my main focus was to get more parents involved, because having been a therapist for, for two years at that point, I realized that one of the biggest indicators of how well a child does is how involved the family is and their, and their parents are. So I went out almost on a crusade of getting parents to come to our events and come to our meetings and drag them and, and to bribe them with, with coffee and donuts, you know, any way to get them there. And in the past two years, we really got a lot more engagement. Um, what got me into politics myself is, again, putting roots down. I wanted to get involved, and I saw a lot of the issues going on in my community. I've heard a lot of issues from my patients who live in different parts of the city. And I figured, you know what, I can do more and reach people on a broader scale as opposed to just my one hour a week in my office. So I got involved in campaigns. I volunteered on a campaign a couple years ago. And in that process, I learned a lot. The first thing I learned is that everything you see on TV is exactly right in real life. You know, politics is a dirty game. And it's really crazy. But you know what? I had a lot of fun being involved in the campaign. So this year, I decided that I would run because with all the division in the country, I figured I can do a lot with my unique perspective as a therapist, as a PTO president, and as a Republican to kind of see both sides and working directly with majority low-income population, I knew that we need to find a way to bring both sides together because from my experiences, my closest friends are, are the opposite side of the aisle to Democrats. And some of the best discussions I've had, thoughtful discussions I've had, has been with people who disagree with me. So that's why I kind of got involved now and I'm hoping to continue my crusade to kind of bring more engagement, not only in schools with your children, but also in politics because I think local politics matters almost more than national politics. It's in our backyard. It's where we start. And that's why I'm happy to be here today to kind of contribute however way I can. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Ken. That is beautifully put, that some of the best conversations you have are with people who you disagree with. I think we all got to get there. Like we all, this is the big challenge for these reporters as they go out in the field is how do you, how do you go across the divide? How do you reach out and find the people who you may profoundly disagree with? and really hear them out, really hear what they have to say. And you're living it, and thank you for doing that. Thank Thanks. You. We have about um, 15, 20 minutes left, maybe. I really want to move quickly to questions from the audience. So I think we should just, just let you know there is a uh, microphone right here. And I'd love you all to come up and feel free to um, ask a question at the microphone, if you would. And I'd really appreciate it if you'd let us know who you are. Um, as you, as you ask your question. So welcome, and let us know who you are and what's your question. Oh man, uh, I've never been first before. Um, so my name is Kevin Moriarty. I'm a computer science engineering, computer systems engineering student here at UMass. And uh, I'm kind of going back a bit. Uh, my question is more about your uh, interview at the beginning. Um, 
And with like all the talk of like fake news nowadays and journalism and stuff, um, where's Eisenberg for this discussion? Uh, be because from my point of view, fake news is basically the logical endpoint of the negative aspects of marketing culture spilling over into fields of the world where it should not, you know, be playing. Um, and it kind of needs to be put back in its box as part of the process. And it kind of seems like there would be no one more qualified to help with that than people who are going to school for, you know, that very thing, marketing and, and so on and so forth. For those um, who may not know, Eisenberg is the business school. Oh yeah, sorry, probably should. But I, and I agree with you 100%. This is, this is, journalism is in crisis and, and a lot of that crisis, as Ray pointed out, I thought really well, is about a, a failing business model and a transition to a new kind of journalism that needs to, needs to find its way forward. As Ray said, we're not there yet. I don't well, not even, sorry, but not the business model for journalism itself, but in terms of if you were, uh, you know, fighting a, a virus, for example, you'd want a pathologist. If you're yep. going to be fighting fake news, you want the people who are trained in those areas. Um, okay, thank you. Okay. I appreciate it. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Susan Wozniak, and I have been both a journalist and a college writing teacher. And I started my semesters with a, an anonymous survey. And I asked several questions, and two of them stood out as being a real danger to national security. And one is that I never had a student who had a high school or middle school class in government. And the second one is I would ask them some questions to identify things. Um, the Protestant Reformation, the Enlightenment, and editorial. I had years in which no student knew what an editorial was. Mm -hmm. And to me, that may even be worse than the first one of, of students not having government. Because this way, they can't tell the difference between straight reporting and opinion. Do you have a, uh, that is a beautiful observation, and thank you for making it. I share your horror at how little uh, a, a rising generation knows about media and understands or has any fluency and any sense of media literacy. But is there a question you'd have for the panel? Um, maybe, maybe instead of how, maybe I want to ask, are we going to be able to turn this around? That's a great question. One of the things I just, I, a little shameless sort of pitch here is that WGBH Youth Media, a big part of what we're trying to do with this project, Crossing the Divide, is media literacy across the country. So a part of this project is that if we take these really top emerging journalists and we put them in a van and they drive across the country together and they stop in at high schools along the way, we, we feel they have a chance to, to do a lot of teaching and a lot of engagement and just to see them sort of rock up in a high school and share their story and talk to some of the students and really work with some of those students on developing their own storytelling skills. We are really trying to address that problem that you put your finger on. But the question, um, as you put it, is, is beautifully framed. Is there anyone who wants to take a yeah, hold on. shot at that? So I forgot to mention that I also am an adjunct professor at Pace University where I went to. I teach the intro to psychology. And the first class, I always teach them about being critical thinkers and not accepting what you hear and I really challenge them with giving them a weird, obscure uh, uh, statements and, and have them dissect it and see if it makes sense to them. Yeah. So I think there is a role teachers can play, even if the budget doesn't allow to have a civics course or a journalism course, you can still teach them about being critical thinkers and asking the second question, the third question, and getting other sources as well. So that's yes. a good in-between, but yeah, it would be much better if it was a structured course that would teach them those skills. Yes, yes, thank you. Anybody else? Next question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Eduardo Samaniego. I am a student at Hampshire College, and I do take most of my classes here at UMass. Uh, my question is for Angelica. You could pay a lot less if you just went here. <laughs> <laughs> well, th that's the thing, right? I am originally from the state of Georgia. Uh, but, I'm just uh, kidding. I, I, I love Hampshire. <laughs> yeah, but you're right. Uh, but not quite, though. Um, I am also undocumented myself, and uh, I came to Hampshire College because they do have a full red scholarship for undocumented students that UMass does not, so not really. Um, now, 
check. Um, <laughs> I'm fully checked, um, thank you. So my question for Angelica is, uh, in the state of Georgia, I do understand why we have never passed the Georgia Dream Act or we have given in-state tuition to uh, Georgia undocumented youth or documented youth. Um, I also understand why students with DACA never got to have a driver's license through the uh, Georgia legislature because it is controlled by hard-lined uh, far-right Republicans, including the governor. But now here that I am in Massachusetts, it is a legislature that has been majority Democrat for the past 20 years. It has been a uh, Democrat, Democrat, uh, Democrat, a, a governor who is Democrat for the past eight years before Baker. And uh, so I wanna know why is it that we haven't passed the Massachusetts Dream Act here, if it's control, if the legislature is controlled by Democrats, and why would you be asking us here in this room to do in order to make that Massachusetts Dream Act a reality, if that would were a choice? Yeah, of course. Um, I honestly, to be completely honest, I'm not sure why it hasn't passed. Like you said, you know, the state is Democrat, right? Um, we supposedly care a lot about our students, um, our, you know, documented students, our documented students, you know, our black students, our Latino students. Um, and I'm not sure why, but I know that one of the reasons um, it might be because we, um, are not organizing as much, you know? I feel like maybe if we pushed more uh, to have some action done, then it would happen, right? Um, we have been working um, now with the Pioneer, you know, Valley Workers Association, um, and we are now, you know, pushing to make that happen. But if there's something that, you know, you um, can do would be, you know, to sign petitions to call your officials and ask them why, you know, exactly, why hasn't the DREAM Act been passed in Massachusetts? Why is it not happening? Can I ask a question, like a follow-up to your question? Yeah, just, I'm just curious, so how would that work, though? What role would the state play in protecting you as a dreamer here when it would be federal authorities that would be actually, I hate to say this, but I guess it's the right word, pursuing people like you who came in under that, under those provisions? Yeah, well, you know, um, Connecticut actually, they actually do have the DREAM Act, right? They actually have passed it. Um, and there are a lot more undocumented and documented students here um, in Massachusetts than there are in Connecticut. But would you feel protected in under, a, under a state regulation or a state law? Yeah, of you course, because, okay. um, you know, Connecticut also has driver's license for people who are undocumented, so they could actually I drive, see. you know. It. Uh, so it's more, it's more now of a state issue for us, um, and then, you know, it gets bigger and bigger as it goes. Mm -hmm. um, and like we said, uh, you know, education is another divide, too, because, like he said, we can't apply to UMass. You know, we can't go to the state's universities, but we can go to private institutions like, you know, Smith College, Mount Holyoke College, um, Amherst, and Hampshire, like you pointed out. Um, so, so you have some, some UMass students here. What can they do to help change that here at UMass? Well, you know, they could um, ask um, they could organize to, um, for UMass to give, um, you know, in-state tuition to documented students, to undocumented students, uh, to create, you know, scholarships for those students. We introduced a program at Holy Community College that would charge students that are currently going to HEC an extra $1 or 50 cents in their tuition, and that money would go to a scholarship for undocumented students. It's one dollar, it's 50 cents, you know, that you could give uh, so those students can go to school. So, you know, current students that go to UMass, they can actually do a lot. And because you pay for your own education, you actually have the power to tell them that, you know. You can say, we wanna give, um, you know, this amount of money uh, for a scholarship for undocumented students and undocumented students and even low income students who cannot afford to go to UMass. Great. Can okay, I just say thanks. one more thing um, very quickly? Uh, so, you know, it's, I'm a taxpayer of the state of Massachusetts. I pay my taxes, but I still don't have access to college here. So I'm in many ways paying for students to go to college exactly. here. Exactly. <laughs> and I can't go myself. Uh, that is a good point. That's, 
the same thing for the 10,000 documented students. We do pay taxes right. and we don't get to go to college. But thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. <laughs> not, uh, like, now I get to introduce Kainat oh, Khan, who is on our team. <laughs> She's one of the field producers. Kainat, you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, if I wasn't a journalist, I'd have probably been a labor lawyer. Um, employee side. We saved you from law school. <laughs> you have to tell everyone. Um, and so my question is for the two um, labor professionals on the panel. And I'm sort of curious how labor can be leveraged as a way to cross divides. Because I think at the end of the day, everyone works and everyone sort of wants the same dignity and respect um, and a good wage in their work. Um, it, it's a great question. I think you know, I often say to my students that the one way that unions are different from other organizations is that we don't choose our members. Um, when you have a union by American labor law, you have to represent a majority of people in the workplace. And if you don't, you're, the union's out, right? So it's not like a PTO where certain people might show up or an environmental or organization or you know some kind of special interest group um, where you only have people who agree with you. In a workplace, you have people who run the gamut. Well, it depends on the workplace. Um, but uh, we're actually, UMass Amherst is the largest unionized workplace in all of New England. We have a whole lot of unions, everyone from um, classified staff, uh, maintenance staff, all the way through uh, graduate employees, postdocs, and faculty. Um, so there's there's a huge range, there's a lot of different interests, and the union's job is to represent all of them. It was even more dramatic when I was working in the South and we had communities that were deeply divided, um, racially divided, and, and in other ways, and the only way a union can be voted in is if you can bring those people together. So we had to learn about different immigrant groups that happened to be in that workforce and uh, you know what their culture was like and where they were from and who could reach out to them and what they needed and how they could participate in the union. Um, and, and so I think that's an incredibly important role. Not all unions are doing it well. Um, and we know that, but I think that's, we're seeing a, a sea change in the labor movement. Um, Angelica mentioned the Pioneer Valley Worker Center, which is kind of a new form of labor organizing that's not a traditional union, but it's a worker center that was started by a number of unions to reach out to workers who don't have access to um, unions or to representation. And so um, there are many, many immigrants, undocumented workers, um, farm workers, restaurant workers, workers in you know a, a whole range of industries that are finding ways to come together and build power. And they just won a, an ordinance in Northampton against wage theft because they found that that was a, a very common thing. But it is about bringing people together to, to build power and to and to make demands, and if there are enough of you, that's what unions know, that it's all about collective action, and there have to be enough people to make that demand, and that's what makes the system change. Jim, did you want to? I really can't add, add too much of that, to say th that one of the issues here is that the, the workforce in, in is so fragmented now. It's around here, is, you know, all the large companies are either gone or have shed their work out to smaller companies. So you don't have that focal point where there's hundreds or thousands of workers that can bargain with one owner. It's, I really don't know. It's a, it's a good question, but it's tough, tough it's era. A, it's to a long in. story, the weakening of labor and the divides in our country. There's, um, if anyone's interested, our narrative. museum, if you go to our website, industrial history, Org. We just um, had a scholar in residence do a paper on um, the labor history in Greenfield. It's really insightful and uh, can shed a lot of light on, on the history um, before unions, during unions, and present time. Thank you. So I th thanks, Kana. I think we'll do these last two questions, and I'll bundle them if that's okay. If you ask your questions in sequence, and then we'll we'll see who they most appropriately go to, yes, sir. Okay. I'm Phil Valunas, I'm a refugee from uh, the displaced persons camps in Europe. And my question is, how do you tell the difference between real news and fake news? The way you tell a difference 
is when people present news and they try to present it objectively, that's the fake news because there is no such thing as objectivity. And the real news is when you see people really saying, even if they're saying it wrong, they're saying it with feeling. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that is real news because what they may be saying is a lie, but what their feelings are real. And okay. when you objectively, you don't have any feelings. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Eric. I'm a senior engineering student here at UMass Amherst. And my question is, how are we going to uh, fix the problem with uh, how journalism and advertising goes hand in hand? Because mm -hmm. it's like, you can't have TV news telling you to shut off your TV and like go in the woods. <laughs> like, so what, I don't know what to do about that. All right, so, so, so um, we're right at time, and so maybe I'll just qu I'll quickly take on these, but you guys should jump in, and I want to come back to you to get some closing thoughts. But very quickly, because there's two media questions, and Ray, you should just stand up and jump in if you want to, because you could answer these very well. But I would, I would say to you, sir, about the, about the idea that anyone who pretends to come at it with objectivity, that that's fake news and that those who speak with passion or from their heart are real news. I'd actually say there's a craft and a discipline that is a really proud tradition and something I would really defend and I'd really fight to defend in a free press, which is that we have to try to come at stories as storytellers and pull together a lot of perspectives. And if we share them honestly and we do them with a great spirit of trying to really listen to people and then really share it, we're trying to share stories that can help people uh, so that we're not telling them what to think, but what to think about. And if we do it right, it's very powerful. I think what you're observing is it's not being done right a lot these days, and I would agree with you on that. I would say there's a really strong line in journalism between opinion and those of us on the other side who try to do the craft of, the, of reporting. We need the opinion, too. Of, you know, it's great to get a lot of different opinions and to have them come at us. But one of the things that we've fallen into in this digital age is the lines are now blurred between those of us who work really hard, like these guys, to go out, listen hard, tell stories, get a lot of sides to an issue. That's, that's called reporting. It's a lot easier to sit in your cubicle and just give your opinion. And I want you to try to think, maybe step back, or try to pay attention to some of the people who really put it all on the line, to go out and do the hard work, which we would call ground truth, get on the ground, listen to people, and share their story. That's yeah, reporting. Yes. Reagan uh, put in a rule that you no longer had equal representation on TV stories, where you could have equal time from entirely different viewpoints, but he yep. got rid of that. Okay. But that's I, uh, uh, really pain for journalism, I think. Yep, there's, there's actually a, there's a decent transition to the other question, which was sort of, if I, if I get it right, it was sort of about in the commercial model, how are we going to break through and get signal to just real facts? Like if we have the commercial model driving clicks, then you end up with news organizations like BuzzFeed. Great news organization. They do a lot of really good work. I know people who are excellent journalists there, but they also have a cat's desk. They literally do cat stories like nobody's business. <laughs> Why? Because it puts eyeballs on the website that commercial force of what's going to put eyeballs on the website so you can put advertising up against it. it. I do think it's a destructive force. I've been in the news business for 35 years. Really proud to have worked at great news organizations like the Boston Globe. I worked there for more than 15 years. I think it's a great news organization and it had a really solid business model, but that business model is under siege and under attack. And Ray, I think, outlined that well. I won't, I won't go back into it. But I would say to the student who brought that up, where are you? That was a great question. It's a great question, and I would say basically my journey from for-profit news organization to starting a for-profit website called Global Post to now starting a non-profit called the Ground Truth Project and working at WGBH, which is non-profit, I see huge value in public media. Public media is supported by everyone in this room who goes on and gives to their local NPR station, to their local PBS station. This is um, a, a gathering convened in partnership with New England Public Radio. And yeah, I'm doing an active sales pitch that I think public media has a really sacred role in this troubled time in journalism because they help us to make it feel like we own it. 
And, and if we're doing our jobs right in public media, we're going to really work hard to keep that spirit true. I need to talk about the real impacts on the ground, though, of what's happened in journalism in a city like Springfield. When I was a kid delivering the newspaper, I would occasionally go to the building where you must have gone today, and that was filled with reporters. And I'm sure when you went through there now, there was almost no one there. The Republican and their media partner, Mass Live, uh, together they have almost no resources. So even though crime in Springfield is down 65, 75% in the last 25 years, go to Mass Live when there's a shooting in Springfield. And the top three stories will be the shooting, the aftermath of the shooting, and it's like TV news used to be, and it's the digital equivalent of sticking a microphone in someone's face and saying, aren't you scared now? There was a shooting down the street. And that's what people here see about Springfield, and so they don't live there, and they don't send their kids there, and that divides us. And, now, and I understand they're not, they're not doing it that way because, as a matter of fact, I know that the people at the Republican love Springfield. They don't love it enough to live in Springfield, but they love Springfield. And they want to do what's right, but they don't have the money to do what's right. So they, they chased the police scanner. There was a story, they, the Springfield police started scrambling their scanner signal, and the Republican mass life went crazy. Because was 90% of their stories is just scanner chasing, and they thought they weren't gonna be able to do it, but now they have a special scanner, so I can't listen to the Springfield police scanner, but they can. Now, again, not their fault, but that is devastating to urban communities. You take a community like Hartford, which is just that little bit bigger in terms of the metro. City's actually a little bit smaller population-wise. The metro is much larger, much more significant as a capital. Look what happens at the current when someone gets murdered. Find it, find the story. You won't, because they're covering real news. They still have the, they still have the wherewithal at the current to do some real news. The Republican doesn't, and so all you hear about my community is you know, what Mass Live can afford to cover, and that's on journalism, and it's destroying cities like Springfield, like Holyoke, like Rochester, like Syracuse, and and I don't, you know, I, I don't have a solution, but well, it is I definitely think, happening. I was just going to say, I think you do, which is you write your own blog, and and that's a big part of the landscape now too. So there is a chance for you as a community journalist to do to do some of your own writing, but I, we are. I am attentive to the fact that we are at time. So I want to just say, I think we have a reception um, downstairs. We can continue the dialogue. I would really love to keep going here. I think um, we could, but you've been a great audience. I want to just say, please join us downstairs. Let's continue the dialogue, and thank you very much for coming.